Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the WTF1 podcast, post-Japanese Grand Prix edition. Well, can we call it a Grand Prix? Post-sprint race at Japan edition. Makes a staple title edition. Damn, had, that was to, going quickly. Didn't even, didn't even warm me up, did you? Yeah, didn't even, had to, didn't even let had me to settle into the yeah, podcast yeah. before you said that. Well, thanks for introducing yourself, Tommy. Um, the founder, obviously, here uh, with his orange shirt on. Oh, Max has won. And of course, Katie Fairman, the WTF on author, who's working very hard on the brand new annual that's coming out. And you can pre order right now, wtf1.com forward slash annual. Uh, so that's the first of seven quarter actions. Also, this podcast <laughs> is once again sponsored by Elgato, our season long partners, and making us. Maybe. Sound like professionals. We're not there yet. We're never there. Uh, with all this amazing equipment. So big shout out to them. And also a shout out. And this is my favorite call to action of all of them. Not action. We're not actioning it. Well, we kind of are, actually. Uh, and that's the five star review. This one is from Britain Boy from New Zealand, which is slightly confusing. But there you go. Britain Boy from New Zealand. The WTF1 podcast is so good that I cancel activities to tune in and listen to this great podcast. Without the WTF1 podcast, I might as well live in a cave. I am with you, Matt. Ferrari till we die. Now, I need to know, Britain Boy, what kind of activities are you cancelling? Because yeah. that could be, you know, I'm cancelling doing the chores. In which case, not a big, big moment. But thank you for the five-star review. If you want to get involved, give us a five-star review. And we may well shout you out in the next podcast. So go do that. Pause it right now. Go do it. Lovely. All right. Tommy, you feel like you look like you're in a bit of a rascal mood today. So uh, <laughs> how, how are you? Are you, are you all right? I, I feel I'm like right. I shut you down slightly, but no, I, I enjoyed fine. every second of it. Good. Um, the only thing I can shut you down. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I just had to get it in there because obviously if you go back to the Australian Grand Prix and all those kind of races when you're like, oh, 75 points. Um, but yeah, here we are. Four races actually, to think, go. That's fine. Whatever. Um, I'm di- actually disappointed that you're not wearing a cape. Uh, well, it's, True. it's on display. I'll put no, it at the end. It's Max Verstappen's world title podcast, and you're not wearing the cape. You're just a, you're a fake fan. That's it. You're a fake <laughs> Max fan. It really is. Oh, um, I got this from the WTF1 shop that says "Simply Lovely." Oh wow! Nice. Shop.wtf1.com if you want to go to cop your own. And uh, yeah, Casey, how's the annual coming along? Beautifully. Like I've seen all the designs for this year. It's so much brighter and more colorful and awesome than last wow, year brighter and more colorful than last year yeah like there's so like much color like we're going to be running <laughs> we're going to be running these printing companies driving there's so much color in there um Amazing. and obviously like good race reviews and puzzles yeah. and quizzes and all this funky stuff it's not yeah it's not just paint by numbers Funky stuff, everybody. There you go. You heard it here first, first boomer term of the podcast. And I'm the one writing the book. <laughs> it's doomed to fail. <laughs> no, it's not. Go, go uh, pre-order it's if really you uh, if you want to. Uh, you can do that already. Uh, WTF1.com forward slash annual. Right. Three word race reviews from fans. Trinet Cliveland. Still very confused. Maha underscore Ahda. Ladif. Latifi, Latifi, Latifi <laughs> got points. You can tell I've been up early. Uh, Test Alessandria, no more tractors, and Joan Feliciano, Max World Champ. Of course, you had to include that one, Tommy, didn't you? You really did. We, we hadn't covered it enough in the first uh, few minutes, but no worries. So, of course, a lot of a lot of talking points. I think is is safe to say, considering we didn't get a full race, not really anywhere near a full race. Was it? Was it around? What did, was it? Forty officially? minutes or something. It was, it was just over half. It's twenty-eight laps. Yeah, so. that's mad to think that we've got that many laps in, considering I guess some of them behind the safety car, maybe. Mm. But anyway, um, yeah, it didn't feel like a full race, definitely, and uh, we've still got a hell of a lot to talk about. Uh, but before we get on into all of the weird stuff about the race and all the confusion, let's have a few words <laughs> about Max Verstappen becoming a world champion. You, you sneak that one in as well, didn't you? I, did. I, 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 like, I like the way you work, honestly. Um, but yes, Max Verstappen, a two time F1 world champion. And look, we kind of we accepted this. This is not like he's clutched it. He has been in a class of his own uh, this year, uh, even when 
things went against him at the start of the year. He was you know, 40 odd points behind Leclerc at the start. And I was, you know, basking in the glory of Charles Leclerc, not winning it with eight, eight races to go. Uh, but yeah, Max Verstappen and Red Bull as a, as a combination has been far better than what Ferrari and Leclerc have been able to produce. Verstappen has produced less mistakes. He's been so much quicker than his teammate. Uh, not all the time, but at least in the large chunk of this season now. And he's inevitable. It, it really is the case of knowing that Verstappen will be on the pace. And if not, Singapore was a big, like one crazy example of him having a slightly off race. Every other Grand Prix is pretty much on the podium unless something goes wrong with his car or whatever. So it's a, a relentless consistency uh, for Verstappen and a completely deserving world champion. Very much so. There two... I said it. <gasps> <laughs> clip it, clip it. So yeah, two championships in less than a year. It does almost feel like yesterday that we had Hamilton dominating and winning titles and now Max has two. I don't know if it's just like the pandemic has skewed how time feels, but it really does feel like just yesterday Hamilton was doing the same. But yeah, richly deserved. He's shown us some of his phenomenal talent this year and do you know what? I, I still feel like the best is yet to come, which is quite a scary thought, but um, it still seems like it's only the beginning if Red Bull can get their stuff together. Is it 24? 24? 25 now. 25, yeah. Oh, well, he's he getting on. He had his birthday. Like, he's getting the on a bit, day. yeah. He's getting yeah, on, he's but getting... the crazy stat, he has 32 wins and two world championships. Fernando Alonso has 32 wins and two world championships. Besties! He is very... <laughs> very easily crept into the realms mm. of one of the best drivers we've ever seen. Like not just from the facts of seeing him perform over the last few years, but also in the record books, people that tune into formula one in 10 years time. Is Fernando Alonso even going to be seen as this amazing driver that Tommy will still be going on the flag. Yeah. I know you will Tommy, <laughs> but will they all just go, Oh, there goes the boomer again, you know, 55 years old. Yeah. Still going. In his <laughs> Well, another funny thing is that Max mentioned in his post race interview was they were saying about, oh, what do you want to do? And it do, it does really feel like he will. He always talks about how much he enjoys spending time with family and being at home, and he he does feel like he's that like being at home gamer kind of guy, even though he and he just loves racing and that's why he does it. But uh, he mentioned that his Red Bull contract expires twenty twenty eight, and he's only going to be thirty one at that stage. <laughs> and you think twenty twenty eight. If he carries on the way he is, um, goodness knows how many race wins and podiums and titles he's going to get. Uh, well, he'll be an eight-time well, eight world champion, um, so then he can hang up. Oh, that's true. Oh, well, yeah, could That'll be. That'll be perfect um, if he wins the next six world titles, which I, I really don't <laughs> ha hope I'm happens really... for yeah. the sake of the sport. Yeah, true. Um, maybe. Um, it, yeah, his, I mean, the, the actual race itself as well, uh, it kind of summed him up, didn't it, that it, his move up, on the start on Leclerc was sensational. He built up, he won by 26 seconds in a 40 minute race and it's almost normal. But I think that's the scary thing that you're just like, yeah, that was just, that was a Max Verstappen drive, but we almost don't come out of these races and be like, that was one of his best drives of his career because it just seems normal now that he does that. And um, very Hamilton-esque, yeah, isn't it? It's, it is. It is. Um, and yeah, he's got a lot of time still to go. He's got a very good uh, car underneath him now. Finally, one that you know, he can challenge for the world title rather than just the odd win when um, a Mercedes slips up or whatever. So uh, yeah, it's looking very good for him at the moment. But who knows how long he's going to carry on for. It'd be a big shame if he uh, left Formula One prematurely and just won loads of championships and then was like, no, I'm going to retire now and later, play, drop. <laughs> play on my simulator at home instead. That's that's where I want to be. But uh, but no, you know, you got to respect that maybe early 30s is when he's he's thinking of retiring. But that's nowhere. That's not anytime soon. You know, Tommy, you'll be you'll be knocking on the door of 40 years old at that point, won't you? So like that's that will, yeah. you know, maybe for your 40th birthday party, we'll all celebrate Max's eighth world title with you. And it'd be a, it'd be a great it's time. scarier. We'll actually be nearly 40, but that's terrifying. <laughs> but don't worry, you still look like a fetus. So that's fine. <laughs> uh, Tommy, whilst, uh, whilst you're here, let's, let's hear your three word race review, please. So mine is bizarre championship win. And it, of course, is the way Max Verstappen won the title in 
the weirdest way, the most anticlimactic way. Um, I'd said it, I said it on the watch log. I just this year it was kind of like right, he's going to win the title. And I'm going to get 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 that moment where it's like yeah, he's crossed the line. We celebrate. I know for a fact that he's won the title. And then this is even more confusing than last year. Um, obviously, he was going to win it anyway, so you can't question um, you can't question that he was going to win the title sooner or later. But what a weird way! And then for it to happen where he's being interviewed and they're saying you've not won the title, F1 themselves even put a their winner graphic out and wrote something along the lines of championship will have to wait because it's only half points and um and then he's being told he's not one and then he's told he is has won but then everyone's saying he still hasn't so it even continues into the cool down room where he's still going have i or haven't i i don't understand what a weird weird way and then just the icing on the cake when i watched it back was the fact that they even the camera even missed him crossing the line <laughs> So it's just, it's it's just so bizarre. It's just well, the weirdest. There's been a thing. lot of talk, hasn't there, Tommy, about why the camera missed Max Verstappen coming yeah. over the line, and that's because the race finished a lap earlier, potentially, than, yeah, potentially than what it should have. But then, if at you the same listen time, to the video of the F1 release of video where they do the drivers' team radio, and every single driver goes, "What? The race is finished." Yeah, every single one. If you listen to that video on YouTube, they all think there's another lap. It's really odd because Vettel, from what I heard, thought the race was over and there was another lap. And that's the reason why Alonso's on the back of him, which is the opposite of what happened. That was something I also heard. So it, if there was ever you needed concrete proof that the rules are just far too difficult to understand. Formula One themselves didn't know that Max Verstappen was winning the world title when he came over the line like that. That's baffling. Like the the officials are going. Well, I didn't see that line in the uh, the rules and regular. Uh, oh, so when it's not resumed. Oh, but the thing is as well, the Leclerc penalty obviously mm. would have changed the result. But the 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 problem here is the fact that they didn't know it was full point, so they didn't think that mattered. But obviously, can you imagine if we categorically knew and everyone knew, all the commentators, all the journalists, all the graphic team, everyone knew. And it was being talked about that Max could still win it. One, it's a risk that he had such a lead, he might have pitted for fastest lap just so he could win it in Suzuka. Or two, when Leclerc had locked up, imagine the excitement of knowing that Perez, if Perez got through on that final corner, he that would seal Stop the title for champion. Max. Yeah. And it would have been like, oh my God, that's crazy. Or well, maybe for um, you. <laughs> but still. Right, fans just turned off the TV by yeah. this point. But, but, st- but still, it just, it just added to the whole like, he did. He didn't. Oh, um, yeah. Bizarre. It's, it's it's so weird, isn't it? Uh, I I I genuinely I don't know what to say because this this is without a doubt the weirdest thing we've ever had in Formula One. Where in terms of confusion around the rules, when nobody knew, you had Sky pushing the narrative of percentage of points. We had graphics on screen. I don't know, Katie. I, I don't know. What did you make of it? I'm about to sneeze. Bless you. <laughs> well, because lots of people are like, oh, well, Crofty, all race has been saying about this points column table that they've got. But even the teams themselves thought the same. So we can't just all pile on to Crofty. I was listening to the Channel 4 stuff. Alex Jakes was talking about something similar. F1 TV had a similar narrative. So it's not just like a pile on to Crofty. Um, But yeah, it's these rules that have been changed after what happened in Spa last year. And (laughs) slight irony that these rules are written by Michael Massey. (laughs) So there we go. (laughs) His legacy Uh, lives on. I can just imagine him sat there back at like, just sitting back on his sofa, sipping away. Ah, that's a line that I wrote I about it. not being resumed. Yeah. Enjoy that one. So, uh, I can't wait for uh, F1 fixed and all this sort of stuff to reappear. It's ugly head on Twitter, but here we are. What do you mean um, reappear? It never stops. It's, oh, it's, it's always it's the trending virus on Twitter. 
But yeah, we were never going to get the checkered flag win unless it went over to Kota because like you say, Leclerc's penalty is what decided it and that had to be done there and then as like, imagine Max finding out that he'd won the championship when he's in the car on the way to the airport or something like that. They kind of had to make that decision there and then so they could run the graphics package and celebrate and quickly somebody had to run and get that special fluffy chair for him and stuff. So yeah. <laughs> um, it is just ridiculous. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure Max is kind of like, well, I've won it. So I'm happy to have won it and that kind of stuff. And Red Bull had their own celebrations because they was coming to this weekend, some chance that he would win it here. So they kind of had all the merch ready and probably had a, a plan for what they do if he did win here. And, you know, there's footage of them watching the end of the race back and all of these group pictures and stuff like that. So it's a... Uh, at least they've actually able to have some celebration as a team, but yeah, completely baffling. And um, you could just tell that everyone was scratching their heads, like looking around, like, has he won it? Hasn't he won it? Um, but Max probably doesn't care too much. He said he actually, he found it quite funny. So at least he's got a sense of humor about the whole thing. Cause he could have maybe been like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. To be fair, if it, turned, if it turned around and gone, no, let's go back out there and pretend it, you know, let's just yeah. do the last lap again so I can just celebrate it properly. I want the fireworks to go off, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, uh, it was strange. Very odd. But yeah, there was the whole confusion about whether the race had ended because, you know, we heard on team radio and, and the fact that you, you think that when, cause Max crossed the line with four or five seconds to go on the timer and then i think a lot of our assumptions are okay so then he'll do that this lap and then he'll have plus one lap that will be the next lap but then there's also the argument that when it that three hour clock hits that's a hard stop yeah it's a hard stop and then that lap is the final lap so uh, i haven't trawled through the fia documentation but the confusion is that every other motorsport series is normally a that. timer yeah. plus one yeah. whereas f1 because of that time it's not it is a hard stop Everyone, but, like, no, hard stop. No, we've had three hours. Okay, this last lap could stop take where you're on minutes. the track. Okay, like, yeah, y- Yuki Tsunoda crosses the line first. Technically, he's won because uh, it's, he's stopped on three hours. <laughs> Wouldn't have minded that. How does how does every <laughs> scenario you come up with I mean Yuki Tsunoda wins? It's, it's my it's my copium. <laughs> your copium, Aww. your favorite driver yeah. won the world title. <laughs> yeah, I know. What, well, I need some of that copium, please. Um, but but yeah, crazy stuff. Let's let's get into the questions because we're just we're just chatting away. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be one hundred percent certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's incredibly easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. You add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience. So you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash WTF1. That's linkedin.com slash WTF1 to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Team WTF1 member Oliver Buckers. What happened with the points at the end? Max wasn't the champion. Then he is. Why did the points awarded change? Now, they didn't change. And I, I love seeing F1 Twitter go into their storm of, oh, my God, they've changed the rules again. They've made it up, blah, blah, blah. They didn't make it up. They just didn't really know what was going on. I think there's a difference, really, because within the ruling, the the if a, if a race stops under a red flag because it's treacherous conditions, we've done four laps, 15 laps, however many laps, there are columns of how many points are awarded between 25% and 75% or whatever. Um, And if the race cannot be resumed, those points will be awarded depending on how much race distance distance has been completed. However, and this part makes no sense to me, we had a lap delay and then we had a timer to the end. So we got what just over half race distance. But four points were rewarded because the race finished under the timer so the cars were still going round the three hour clock hit the cars go over the line 
its full race distance. Now, for me, that doesn't make any sense because we could, in theory, and this hasn't happened yet, but you never know with Formula One, they'll do anything to try and not give fans refunds, Spa 2021 flashbacks. You could theoretically have a lap, two and two hours, 55 minute delay, a five minute sprint race and four points will be awarded. That's what the wording in the, the regulations could allow. That would allow for a race to have happened, fans to go home really peeved off, but also not being given a refund. And we go away thinking, what the hell just happened? 100% so I, why it was written, by the way, to cover that, like you said, yeah. cover that spa that it's like well you saw the finish even if you saw like six laps or whatever i do wonder whether that ruling will be changed or tweaked they or... want they want to already they've said it themselves because like katie alluded to it was massey uh that wrote massey. it and fia have gone yeah we didn't really mean it like that we're going to change that and now i think they're going to talk to the teams there you go really... Yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, it's a difficult one because when you read the article, like 6.5 of a race is suspended in accordance with Article 57 and cannot be resumed, points for each title be awarded in accordance with the following criteria and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, the cannot be resumed stuff is there. It's in black and white. Um, and the FIA took that and interpreted it how I think the majority of us, like if you take yourself away from the situation that happened yesterday, then you say, yeah, well, if it's, does carry on then it will be slightly different um but it was just a weird situation and it's kind of one of these things and we get it all the time in the sporting regulations where there's a rule which has been written and then there's some sort of other way that it could be interpreted i mean if we want to mention Abu Dhabi last year we could but um what happened um, what happened in the some guy won a championship in some like weird circumstances it's probably oh, okay. best not to cool, talk cool, about cool. it yeah um but that's always going to be the case. So with the sporting regulations, I don't think it's ever going to be perfect. Same with the technical regulations or the you know, international sporting code that they've got. It's kind of just learning from these things. But yeah, it's a weird one. I'm just actually looking on the 2021 regulations, which I have on my Google Docs because I copied it over and I highlighted it and annotated it because I'm a loser. Um, <laughs> and before the change, it just says, if a race is suspended, article... Uh, under article 41 and cannot be resumed no points will be awarded if the leader has completed two more laps and then it goes on to like the 75 percent all this kind of stuff so even there it says and cannot be resumed so maybe it's just a situation that the FIA didn't think they'd find themselves in of like red flagging a race or having something happen and then going back racing because normally if you red flag something um, say it's for an incident to recover a vehicle on the track or whatever, it might take half an hour or 40 minutes to repair some barriers, but then you'll go back racing and it will normally fall within the time frame. I don't know. I'm just literally spitballing you, here. You're, you're right. You're right. The, the, that's the problem is because they've now got this three hour hard stop, right? Whereas yeah. if you look at something like Canada 2011, which mm. is obviously famously red flagged for hours, but then when they resume, they could continue the race and it didn't matter that it finished like four hours and the fans were waiting for four hours for the race to finish they did the whole distance because the track was good enough but now because it's a hard stop it creates the weird situation where you haven't done a full distance even though you reach the finish so that's the that's that is the reason like you say is is the fact that it is it's never happened before because normally the red there'd be a red flag and you'd get the racing going but it's obviously been cut off because of this new three hour hard stop. That's when the race finishes. And that meant that it wasn't a full race distance, but it was always going to be full points. And that, that that's the thing here. Like, like Matt said that it was always full points. They've not changed the rules halfway through. <laughs> you could, you can tell because I watched the race back and near the end when Leclerc and um, Perez are battling, they layer the points and it says Max is not champion, but they've put full points on there. So yeah. they know that it's going, but the problem is that's not been communicated with teams, drivers, journalists, everyone. I don't know why the, the F1 graphic team know or like, or, or what, but for whatever reason, none of the commentary teams, even F1 TV themselves didn't know. Even I, it's mad. So, yeah. I cannot believe, right, that not one person has gone, 
they're, they're, they're barking up the wrong tree here. Like, just, surely someone within Formula One has had a conversation with some. I cannot believe that nobody in the world of Formula One, the pinnacle of motorsport, has not I can. at least. <laughs> yeah, but I'm also well, I there's cannot so many, believe that. So many journalists like that have said, oh, I kind of I wish I had read through the rules and seen that and that kind of thing and picked up on it. I'm the same. I if love you'd have been the one to know. If you'd have been the one to know, you'd have felt Imagine like an absolute that. boss. Wouldn't you? Imagine that. Yeah. But I'm too I'm busy trying to find bloody one. memes on Twitter for the <laughs> <laughs> tweeting along for the race and going like, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. So I didn't have time to to stop and look at the sporting regs. But everyone's saying the same. Thanks, babe. So what you're saying is, if I wasn't on Twitch and you didn't have to do the memes, you'd have found it. I would have been. You'd have you'd have been savior. crowned. No, the we've queen said, of the FIA. We've said <laughs> several times that you sleep with the rule book. Like, where were you, Katie? Got that one on. right. You that should have, well You should have definitely, definitely uh, known this already. Off by heart, the whole thing. Recite it. Um, okay. W- one thing that is quite funny and like, well, it's just mad. Is the fact that the the main gripe about Abu Dhabi was they didn't stick to the rules. Now they have stuck to the letter of the rules. And it still managed to cause controversy, I which guess, could only happen in Formula One. And it's understandable, yeah. like it's because the rules are it's because the rules are worded very weird, <laughs> and the fact that because um, because you know I put, I put something on Twitter, and you, I'm starting to see the odd reply now where it's like people are just capped in hindsight, and they're like, oh well, it was written in the rules. If if the journalists managed to actually look at what happened, but it's like it can't be that clear if the every teams. Formula One team. Every yeah. journalist, Red Bull every didn't TV know. broker, like, Red yeah. Bull didn't know because otherwise they could have pitted Max asked to pit the fastest lap, and they said no because it wouldn't make a difference. Yeah, crazy. There you go. Everyone was wrong, not just uh, commentary and and whatnot, and and TV and etc. Everybody uh, didn't know, and that's that's a scary thing for Formula One uh, that nobody understands the rules fully. Uh, right, let's move on now to a question from XD underscore F One Pro. Did Charles deserve the penalty. Yes, yes, he did. Move on. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, uh, he absolutely straight lined the life out of that last chicane. Um, probably the definition of gaining an advantage. Uh, and then also, I'm sure the stewards didn't look too favorably on Charles then squeezing Perez, who tried to eke around the outside uh, and have a drag race towards the line, similar to what maybe Alonso and Vettel had. Um, even Leclerc himself said that he deserved the penalty. Benotto, on the other hand, <laughs> where has Benotto been? This he wasn't there. He, was, he's not been he there. wasn't there. And know, Toto wasn't there. But but what he's been saying, Mum, have you seen what he's been? He's been popping off. Well, like, he's, he's probably been watching not it on TV. There. And he's like, he's, he's, he's like no. he's a keyboard warrior. He's become yeah. Like, <laughs> he's he become was, F1 Twitter. Uh, it's been hashtag F1 ixed. Have you uh, probably not that far off? He's been kind. Oh of, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if you guys have seen it as well. Him saying mm. no, you haven't. No, okay, well, I just go... I just saw the thing about Leclerc um, right. saying that he deserved it. Okay, you find gonna, it. I'm I'll say what Leclerc's quote, quote, quote was. You, you crack on. Yeah, uh, it, let you say. Um, Charles, did he deserve the penalty? Yes, he admitted it himself. Uh, his quote was, I did a mistake and tried to minimize it by go, uh, trying to go straight. I was not aware this was the last lap, but the five second penalty was the right thing to do. Fair play yeah. to him. He admitted it. Okay. It and on the other hand, <laughs> Bonotto <laughs> said, Bonotto told this. <laughs> Sky Italia and he popped off. He's like, I have little desire to comment. I think the choice of the FIA is ridiculous and unacceptable. In the last race, they took an infinite time to decide while today a few seconds. There was no advantage gained by Charles. We will talk about it in the appropriate places, but this decision taken without even listening to drivers is unacceptable as there was no advantage gained. Today, it took them a moment to give the penalty to Leclerc. Three hours in, Singapore with Perez. Poor guy who couldn't even follow the safety car. Two identical <laughs> infractions, but different penalties. Congratulations to Max for the victory and Tabjet Hero for the way. Um, <laughs> the small print. That's so yeah. funny. Congratulations, but, Max. The conditions enjoy, apply. enjoy the championship. Hope Max is very happy. He's not happy. He's not happy. Uh, and I'm like, Bonotto, why now? It's, it, it seems similar to when uh, Michael Massey said uh, uh, to Toto, finally stood up to Toto in yeah. Abu Dhabi and was like, yeah. oh, it's a motor race. It's like this Bonotto. He's like, now he's popping off. Now that they've lost Maybe the title. Maybe now because he could watch the race from home and actually see what's going on rather than just being stressed on the pit wall about what tyres to put on, maybe. Yeah, maybe. But the yeah, you're you're right. The fact that this is again really annoying because it contradicts everything. But we're there going, 
You don't need to speak to the drivers. I know they've actually done it. This is the thing. Stick to that. Do that mm. every race now. And fine, if if that's now the rule and you do it for everyone and you make decisions quickly, perfect. Um, I see why he's annoyed because the fact that it didn't happen in the last race and we were here complaining, why do you need to speak to the driver? He's just going to say this and that. Um, I actually think that was a good decision just to get it done straight away. And I want to see more of that from F1 and the stewards for everyone should yeah should but, uh, but it does highlight the inconsistencies right yeah, because yeah, you exactly. know Perez was asked to uh, oh speak about why he couldn't keep 10 car lengths behind a safety car Leclerc he might have had a reason for the reason like why he went straight on and if that's the you know the precedent that's been he might set, have sneezed and accidentally yeah. pushed the throttle or something he could have <laughs> finally just o- had this overwhelming feeling of oh my god I've lost the championship and he just forgot how to break and yeah. you know there might be you know this is the thing. It th- that doesn't make sense, and it, it for me it feels like the FIA almost felt rushed into making the penalty so that the podium was right, and then that Max Verstappen could be crowned world champion. Like it's, it is inconsistent. Like, I will give that. I still think Charles Leclerc deserved the penalty, even if he said that you know a, a dog jumped in his car. I still think that even if it was Frank, maybe Tommy. Um, I'm sure Frank would probably be on Max Verstappen's side as well, but. It doesn't make sense, personally, for me, that if they want to have a discussion with all the drivers, they should. But it should be more, as you say, Tommy, what we did see. But then, of course, it's going to infuriate Bonotto when Perez was allowed to drop off an essay about why he didn't follow the safety car procedure. Okay, my homework. (laughs) Why why he broke the rules three times uh, in terms of uh, following the safety car properly. So, uh, yeah, I can understand Bonotto's comments. Yeah. I'm in agreement with both of you. I think he deserved the penalty, um, but consistency is that key word, the buzzword that keeps coming up every single weekend, whether that's how they like how quickly they make the decision of the penalty or even the penalty itself being applied. I know that everyone on Twitter was flooded with examples of when people have cut corners and not received penalties like that and this kind of thing. But um, I'm in answering this question, I think that he did deserve the penalty. So it's just a bit of a shame that his little mistake actually gave Max the championship. Well, it sums up well, Ferrari in a, as a whole, doesn't it? Not really? like as a whole, but yeah. Um, like Ferrari slash Leclerc making mistakes and giving Max for stuff in the world title. Maybe that's what deep down Ferrari, like we can't win the title. What we can do is make Max not get a proper chaos. celebration. <laughs> and get a penalty post-race. I'm obviously joking. Right, next question. Rob J. Vale. Given all the commentary team were constantly updating us on the possible percentage points allocation and it was all over social media, does not one person in the FIA think probably should inform them all that this will be full points? They are not sealed in a vacuum, right? I think the FIA might well be just a figment of our imagination. <laughs> I think they could well just be characters in a TV show and they're not actually real. Um, and that's this kind of highlights what I was saying earlier. Why, why has nobody informed the commentary Etc. During the red flag, there was like a two-hour delay. They could see they were that we candy were probably crush. not going to get a full race, especially with the fact we started with 40 minutes on the timer to go. That possibility was absolutely on the cards, unless there was a down downpour again and they red flagged it, and then it would have been the percentage points. Why has nobody told anyone? That's what I don't get. And that's why the FIA aren't real. I know that I mentioned in a podcast earlier this year about this job role that I think needs to happen. And even more so now after it it is. Yeah, I want this job. If I, if you're listening, Hans, give me a call. Um, Send me a DM on uh, on Twitter. It'd be great. But um, they need a permanent person in the race control room, communicating with the teams, with the media and the broadcasters, whether it's a WhatsApp chat or an email chain or whatever it may be. Um, Bebo. I've actually got... Be Bebo. real. <laughs> be real. <laughs> be real. Just a picture Amazing. every 24 hours. That's how they do it, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's probably better than what they've got now. Um, I've actually got a rant coming out on the website, so that will probably be there when this goes live um, on audio or YouTube. Because, yeah, it needs to happen as soon as possible. But they do. They need a line of communication to explain procedures like this. The point example is a great one. Um, and I just think it would make life so much easier to just say, hi, guys, just so you're aware, you know, this is a situation. Full points will be awarded. Hope you're having a nice rain delay. Do you remember? Kiss, Cheers, hon. Kiss, 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 kiss Katie Feynman. <laughs> Do you uh, do you remember um, end of last year when they said 
that they were going to make changes to make the FIA better. Do you, do you remember that? Do you remember when they were oh, yeah, making structural yeah, changes to ensure kind of that this kind of stuff doesn't happen? I don't understand why. Um, kind of what what you're saying, Kate, as well, is that why they can't just have someone that tells them this and communicates with them? Because yeah, um, like we mentioned earlier, the F1 graphics throughout the entire race were saying it. If you watched it on Sky like we did, you this whole like column one, column two, column three, that was Sky lay, overlaying their own graphic to try and be helpful to show you what it was because the world feed weren't doing that. But obviously the reason was the fact that it was always going to be four points and if it continued and went to the end. Um, so that's the confusing thing. I just don't understand why you can quite easily get an idea of the how things are being interpreted amongst commentators and you know i've not seen one tweet where where from anyone uh, around the world that's gone well our commentator knew no one knew no. Like, mm. everyone got it wrong um even f1 tv themselves which is their own broadcast didn't know that it was going to be four points and that's what the confusion was the f1 own instagram account said it was half mm. points <laughs> why it's just absolutely ridiculous and what why they can't sport. just have i know what a sport it is just like the circus continues isn't it but why they couldn't why they don't have um this happens in the wec um you can hear the race the race director and he says like there's going to be a vsc in five seconds and this goes on to our later point because we all know about uh what's gonna we're gonna talk about next but things like that you can just communicate. It goes to every single driver. It goes to all the cars. It's broadcasts, so everyone hears it. They've but got a notice press board, a, press a button. No, no, but, it's sorry. four points. Tommy, sorry. That's far One too easy. One problem with that. It's too easy. Too much transparency into the yeah. inner workings of the FIA. They don't want that. They don't want well, people to know how They don't it want works. people to know that they're just got their feet up. And and in the reality, the mic is going, ah, I don't know. <laughs> mm. It's Max World Champion. Get the rule book out quick. Wait, is that yeah. Michael Massey's document? Oh, Jesus. Oh, no. There used to be a CCTV where you could have a look into the race control. That's gone. <laughs> that is yeah. literally just SpongeBob running around on fire. Yeah. That's, that's literally <laughs> what that is. Yeah, I mean, FIA do have a media delicate. They have a, a gentleman called Tom Wood who's uh, really, like, he's great at his job, but they just need, I'm guessing he's busy during the race. I don't know what he's doing, but they need somebody in race control that, like, Niels Vittich can say, um, it's going to be full points, and they can go, okay, babes, I'll just text everyone, let them know. I really hope Did, the FIA I, actually speak like that to each other. Okay, babes, okay, hun. All right, let's do like best to get like the If, if I worked in the Perfect. FIA... Um, I love the way this has literally just become <laughs> Katie's job interview. Like this podcast has become. I'm Katie's never going to get a job though, which I'm actually quite sad about because I really do find what the FIA does really interesting. But there's, I've absolutely shot myself in the foot with ever getting a job with them in the future. Yeah, I feel like I maybe not much. speaking too highly about maybe your future employer there's uh, maybe. So I've probably where... not done myself too many favors, but yeah, it's very interesting. It certainly is. Uh, and can you believe we have got this long of a podcast on such a show? We're not race? even on, we're still uh, on we're Tommy's even, race review. We're literally on Tommy's, this is this is incredible. I hope you were all enjoying this. Settle yourselves in, leave us a like on YouTube if you're watching us uh, on video and if you're enjoying it. And I uh, hope you've got a, a lovely hot drink with you because uh, we're still going probably for the we're next three, the four days. Um, right. Uh, yes, to kind of sum up, Rob, yes, they are sealed in a vacuum. Uh, Team WTF1 member Formula Wonderland. If Max and Red Bull don't know the championship is won, then the rules aren't clear. Is it time to make a new rule book for 2023 that is easy to understand? F1 has an influx of new fans coming in from new Netflix, etc. And if all the hardcore lot can, can do is say, don't know if something happens when we're, we're going to look like frauds. Okay, interesting. Um, yes, it is time to write a new rule book. But also, I think we have to appreciate that Formula One is an incredibly com complex sport to get right. There's always going to be especially for incidents, for example, n there is never the same incident. There's always going to be slight nuances in when you, you know, assess two drivers crashing into each other or whatever. Um, there definitely needs to be some kind of rewrite, as clearly nobody knows what the current rule book is. So all, all the teams, the FIA, etc., should sit down and make sure this doesn't happen because again we have another interpretation of the rule book that nobody understood or really knew 
this time, obviously, it wasn't the race director that just announced something. It was more the fact that it wasn't clear for any team, even though it was technically written in the rule. But maybe they need like a little refresher. You know, like how you have like refresher work classes. You sit down yeah. and it's about, I don't know, blooming health and safety, data protection don't or run something. with scissors. <laughs> yeah, and they're, and they're just going to sit down and go, right, everyone, this is the FIA rule book. Okay, page one of 573. Yeah, no, probably, it's... Yeah. Somebody started talking with his mic muted, I think. Or... Oh, okay. I, sorry, you ended that, that point quite quickly. I, was, I know, I, I did. Um, I was just, my brain just turned off. No, so. it's fine. You're just bored of talking about it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, this isn't a new thing. Formula One, like you say, is an extremely complicated sport. Sad reality is, it's always been this way to a point. Like, look at... Um, if you watch the Senna movie, for example, uh, Suzuka when and Senna goes over the runoff area to rejoin and it ended up being like he got a penalty and all this kind of stuff it's always been quite political and there's loads of rules and it, like you say every incident is different every circuit is different every piece of tarmac is different every corner is different um so there's so many different things to consider i think it all just comes down to communication and why they can't just communicate things simply and easily for the fans to understand and i feel like that would just be being more aware of the race narrative and um kind of what's going on um because we're we're all watching the race and we know that the commentators now had had got it wrong and we'd all got it wrong and everyone on twitter got it wrong so it just needs like one person that knows what the rules are to see that's happening and just communicate it with the fan base and mm. the commentators and everything so everyone knows and then you just don't get a weird situation and then you've got the excitement of the final lap going oh max can actually win the world title on this day and then the whole leclerc incident mm. is like oh my god this is this could actually change things and it's wild so yeah it doesn't doesn't help anyone now, I think the important thing with all of this is that the FIA got it right, which is the, like I said, the important thing here, rather than them going three hours down the line. Oh, actually, yeah, we just went with what everyone said on F1 Twitter and gave half points. But actually, we could have given four points. Like, at least they got it right, which is the most important thing here. I don't think the rule book itself needs to be completely rewritten. Well, firstly, there's more than one rule book. There's the sporting regulations, which is 117 pages and 63 articles. And then even in that, they've got like all sorts of different, like 62.1, 62.2. 60. So there's so much of it in there. There's also the technical regulations. There's the international sporting codes, which is applied across all FIA championships. So that's when we're talking about like Lewis Hamilton and his nose stud, for example, that's in the international sporting code appendix H I want to say like there's a C D G H. She's read the whole thing and knows exactly where it is. Well, this is the thing. I don't know all of it and nobody. Appendix H point four point three two. Yeah. But nobody's like, ever going to know all of it. I know I had criticisms last year to say Abu Dhabi, uh, Michael Massey should know the rule book, you know, like the back of his hand, because that's his job as FIA race director. But to your average Joe, we're not going to know all of it because it's there's so much information to take in. Sometimes the language is very archaic or you need a glossary to understand what some of it means. There's references to other parts and different documents. There's a lot of cross-referencing. I think it's definitely due a slight overhaul. Um, it definitely did after Spa last year and we got it, but just obviously some of the wording could be interpreted in different ways. But um, I don't know, if we make the rule book really simple to be like, you can do this, you can't do this or whatever, um, and try and streamline it, then there will just be more reasons for more loopholes in the future. Like the reason it's such a huge, massive document is because over the 70 year history of Formula One, things have happened and the rules have been changed to reflect that. So we don't, it doesn't happen again. So I don't think that we need to just completely like start from scratch again with the rule book or anything like that. I think that's actually quite a dangerous thing to do. But um, once, like Tommy said, it's just communication. Like the FIA knew, why did somebody just not send a message to say, 
confirmation. Put it on the notice board. You don't even have to create a blooming group WhatsApp chat with everyone in it. Just put it on the notice board, which is where all the penalties go. If something's under investigation, the percentage of chance of rain in a race, just pop it on there and just say, reminder that full points will be awarded. Full stop. It takes five seconds. And do we would have we wouldn't have had all of this. <laughs> do you think the FIA... You're going to say deep breath. <laughs> no, yeah, that as well. Uh, do you think the FIA did this on purpose? Do you think they were like... Well, they silly if they did. Well, who knows the rule book now, huh? <laughs> Just sat back. Yeah, now we've done it to the rule book. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, they can't, they can't... Yeah, they can't be... Um, you know, criticised for what they did or how because no, they, they were followed right. their own rules. Yeah, they, they did, did it properly. They're just a bit toned. They just didn't let anyone it. else know. <laughs> oh dear, good and stuff. It's just also hilarious that Massey wrote that one confusing rule, but that was his contribution to the the rule book. The Massey legacy lives on. Right, I think we have just about done it on FIA. All right, let's let's move that one swiftly well no not fia actually uh, i mean just <laughs> yeah i was gonna just, say, just, uh, gonna my say next next one. Is chapter ruined. one of the fia is done <laughs> katie what's your three my word review? three word race review is a new low and that is in reference to the recovery vehicle that we had on track in wet and dangerous conditions with very low visibility so Strap yourselves in, everybody listening, because I'm I've got coffee. half a page, page of notes on this. So let me just oh, sorry to put my seatbelt on. Right, here we go. Thank you. Also, thank you to everybody that also was tweeting me saying I can't wait for Katie's FIA rant. So I hope I've done you justice, babes. Right. When I saw the video, I can see you both put yourself on mute. <laughs> when I saw the video of Gasly and this recovery truck. I'll be honest with you, okay? I'm, I'm open and vulnerable on this podcast. I actually cried looking at that video because it might be the early mornings mixed with the tiredness, but I just felt so overwhelmed with helplessness, with anger that we had a situation like that again. I mean, I know lots of people that are listening to this podcast have discovered Formula One or rediscovered it in the last few years, and weren't watching religiously like we were when it was 2014 in Suzuka, but that was one of the darkest times that we will ever see in Formula One. I'm still traumatized by it. And I know I speak on behalf of a lot of fans when I say that, um, and it was just horrendous. And after seeing that clip yesterday, it just felt like nothing had been learned and it was just horrible. Now, the speed that Gazi was going, we can address in a moment, but how is it in 2022 at the same circuit that we lost Jules Bianchi in such traumatic circumstances that this can happen again and actually have the recovery track on the circuit itself? I mean, we had drivers on the radio and after in media pen interviews saying it's the worst visibility they have ever had in their racing careers. That includes F4, F3, F2, like Albon was saying the same, Norris was saying the same. I mean, Pierre didn't even see the advertising board, the Rolex board that he picked up on the floor. Drivers couldn't even say who they hit at the start. Like we saw with Seb and Alonso, you know, they, he couldn't say, oh, I've hit Alonso, I've done this, because they just couldn't bloody see what they were doing. And then obviously Carlos had his aquaplane, which is unfortunate. But to then put a recovery track in the location where a car's just lost control and that plane is mad. I know they were going slower because they were under safety car, but there's still the risk factor there. I've seen a video of the tractor joining the track. And this is from a fan's perspective in the grandstands. There's around 17 seconds from when the tractor sort of appears near the track and then getting to Science's car, and then when the safety car reaches them with the majority of the pack of uh, drivers, Carlos isn't in the car. He's out the car by this point. He's crossed the track, he's safe. Could we not have waited just a little while longer for the majority of the packs to get past? I know that there will still be the issue with Gasly, and once again, we can address that later, but just wait a few moments until the majority of the pack are passed, and then we would have had a red flag by that point anyway. Um, and, you know, we can hear from the radio that so many drivers are surprised to see that there. 
Um, I know that Gasly would have still encountered it as he had to start from the back and then he had to pit for a new front wing after the whole advertising board thing. But there needs to be other processes in place, um, similar to what Formula E has, which is that the race director in Formula E, Scott Elkins, is able to communicate with all of the drivers through a radio transmission. And I know that Tommy mentioned this about WEC as well. I think that's got it, where they can warn the drivers about safety car countdowns or whatever it may be. Full course yellow is about to be implemented. Formula One needs to introduce something like this where it's not two way because I think that would just get chaotic. But there's like an emergency button that the race director can push, which goes to all drivers that can warn there's a recovery vehicle on the track. Please be aware it's at turn 12 where Carlos has crashed. Like, you know, it's there. So they don't pass it and think, oh my God, what on earth is that? And that might also be useful for things like safety cars in the future or you know like why they use it in WEC or Formula E something like that needs to be implemented but it was just frightening to see and rightfully so F1 fans around the world have kicked up a fuss the drivers I mean crikey Pierre Gasly what he was saying in the media pen afterwards obviously we heard a little bit on radio when he was talking to his guys on the pit wall during the red flag saying that he could have died um He's he maybe composed himself a little bit better um, in the the media pen, but still the quotes that he was giving, man, it like was brutal. And he's fully in his right to be so annoyed at the FIA. Like I don't think there was a single driver that didn't either address it full on or allude to the fact that it was extremely dangerous. And when you've got twenty of the most experienced drivers in the world complaining about something like that, then it it needs to change and it can never happen again. So there's my FIA rant. I hope that <laughs> you haven't just skipped forward from it because yeah, that came from the heart, but there we go. Yeah. I think um, preaching to the choir with this one, uh, Katie, I think that we all feel very, um, very similarly uh, to it. It was just wrong I, it, I i know that you know I, I completely agree i think we should have uh, a race director being able to speak to all all the drivers i don't think there should be a recovery vehicle on track ever ever doesn't matter if they're in red flag uh, red flag conditions yellow flag conditions mm-hmm. if there are cars going around the circuit there should not be a recovery vehicle on track we uh, we had the horrible moment in 2014 with jules bianchi and that tra- that tra- particular um recovery vehicle wasn't even on the track like that was without a doubt the stupidest decision I have seen in so, so many years uh, from the FIA. And what pisses me off even more is their statement where they said, while it is normal practice to recover cars under the safety car and red flag conditions, which basically is like, we're just following the rule book due to the particular circumstances and also taking into account feedback from another drivers. The FIA has launched a thorough review of the events and they basically then went, this is part of the common practice of debrief and analysis of all race incidents. So like the way in which they kind of just gloss it over as this is the rule book. And they, they just started it with that. Just infuriates me. Yeah. They, they, they just don't understand racing. Like how, I just don't get it. Like, I know it's a safety car, right? But we have known, us as Formula One fans, watch the sport. We know that drivers that have pitted and are behind the safety car, as in not behind the queue, and they are quite a way away, are going to push to try and get back to the safety car. They will take, by the Delta, as many risks as they are permitted uh, by the rule book. To think that then putting a recovery vehicle where it was probably one of the most treacherous parts of the track was okay, how they thought that that was fine why is there any rush to pick up carlos Sainz's car why is it not an immediate red flag button as i said in the video that we put out very early monday morning if you're from the uk it was no surprise that these conditions were an absolute joke for the drivers we saw from the second they left the grid that it was spray serious amounts of spray i don't know and it, it happens all the time when there's a big crash they don't react straight away I don't know if they're taking into account the whole big picture of the race and they want to release the safety car at an optimum point or pick up the leader, whatever. I don't know why they don't just have a big red button, which is for the red flag. 
it is quite obvious. We not just had that. We had Vettel turning into Alonso. We had Joe Guan Yu spinning at the hairpin just beforehand. Press the red flag. I don't know why they're even trying it. So it was a red flag every day of the week. The second you watched Carlos Sainz's onboard where he crashed, they're not getting that car out the way for the next lap. So just red flag it. It's the easiest thing to do. The conditions are bad. And yeah, agree agree with you. The only thing um, I disagree with Katie's brilliant run is like, like you say, the fact that they shouldn't need to press a button and say there's a recovery vehicle on the track. There should never be a recovery vehicle on the track. And one thing that I saw doing the rounds that uh, a journalist who is not Matt's, Matt's dad called Mark Gallagher. <laughs> so <laughs> but, just a heads up. So yeah, I think I imagine they do. Um, shared uh, mm. something from the FIA, which is their own document about the Bianchi accident report. And the quote is, it is considered fundamentally wrong to try and make an impact between a racing car and a large and heavy vehicle survivable. It is imperative to prevent a car ever hitting the crane and or the marshals working near it. So that is them saying, it doesn't matter how strong we build Formula One cars. It doesn't matter if we have a halo. It doesn't matter if we have this. It doesn't matter if we have that. Jules Bianchi's accident, there was no way he was going to survive. The problem was that there was a uh, recovery vehicle there and there's nothing we can do to stop a Formula One car when it hits that, making that survivable. So why can they put it on a racetrack? And the thing that annoys me the most is, and I won't go into, um, well, maybe I will, but the fact that Sky, the, the fact that Sky went down this narrative of, well, I've almost like scapegoating Gasly. I don't understand it at all because what I'd like to see is a full onboard of Gasly's entire sort of lap. But if he's sticking to a delta, you can't... They they even analysed it on the Skypad where they slowed it down to a ridiculously so slow speed and showed that the light changed just as he was about to pass that truck, right? So the light then, going from yellow to red flag. Yellow to red, yeah. yeah. And even on his steering wheel as well, you can see it's slightly delayed with exactly. the red flag. Exactly. But like Matt said, a yellow flag period, they are well within their right to do the Delta. Sebastian Vettel said it. The safety car, uh, sorry, the virtual safety car was introduced because mm. of the Bianchi incident. It slows everyone down. It makes sure they don't know. But the safety car doesn't because if you're at the back, you can go quicker to catch up. So that's their rules, right? And for them to say that the second they put the red flag on, what is Gasly meant to do? Is he meant to slam the brakes on, which ironically, by the way, would, would probably make him aquaplane and smash into the side and spin yeah. off or smash into the crane anyway, is absolutely ludicrous. And the fact that they can just be like, oh, well, it's sort of your fault as well. Like, it's just not. Like, it's he's well within his right to do the Delta and then... I imagine he saw the red flag and slowed down potentially, but uh, I need to see it. But it, it should never have been on there in the first place. And the just fact to, that they can even try and cover it is just absolutely ridiculous. Just to clarify as well, um, the penalty that he received was actually speeding after the incident, mm, not exactly. not during. Um, uh, and that's something that needs to be addressed. These are two separate incidents. So he got a 20-second penalty, which was a drive-through, wasn't it? And two penalty points for speeding up to was it 260 or something 260 kilometers an hour through or 250 yeah. uh during the red flag right 12 30 mm, yeah so it was so is, that spoon? is that spoon is that spoon yeah, yeah spoon okay so he's obviously sped up probably absolutely enraged to see mm. the tractor on track after losing a very good friend uh you know eight years ago um it, of course it's going to enrage him and i think the fia even said oh we accept the you know, the nature of what happened or whatever, but also gave him a penalty. So just to clarify, he wasn't going that speed past the tractor. Um, yeah. But uh, I felt incredibly uncomfortable with um, with how Sky addressed it. Um, awful. Because, it absolutely awful. And then they started backtracking when they saw what was on F1 Twitter. They were like, well, we know so we just can't down. blame either side. So it's like, well, no. Gasly is doing his job as a Formula One driver and sticking to the rules. It is the FIA's job, as long as Gasly is sticking to the Delta, et cetera, which he did up until the point of the, the tractor, as long as he's doing that, he is not in the wrong at all. He can, if he, like, I, 
I absolutely just can't believe that they put the risk of that tractor out there with no visibility. One driver could have just ventured offline slightly. You know, it, well, there's a clip of Ricardo warming up his tires, and he likes almost. Well, they don't into know it, it's he gets there. So close, yeah, because they don't know they it's don't... there because they're going past in the safety car and. This, you can just back, about see goes, what's in front of you. Exactly. It goes back to that whole thing of the fact that it's unsurvivable if a Formula One car hits a recovery vehicle. So it doesn't matter the fact that they go past it with in a safety car period. It's absolutely, it's, it's madness. I mean, it shouldn't be there in the, the first place. The whole accident was happening when there were yellow flags. My camera's exactly. got weird. Sorry. I was just <laughs> getting you back in focus. I was trying to get this to focus. But Sorry. yeah, the... Um, yeah, it's absolute madness. And then we've not even mentioned the fact that the the onboard where like a marshal's like stepping mm. out the way of the car. Why did they need to do it there and then? It's a red flag what every day rush? of the week. Like, what is the rush? Like I said, right at the start, they're never getting that science car recovered for them to just go around on the next lap and it'd be fine. Just wait. It's what every driver said. Just just wait and get yeah. them in the pit lane, red flag it, v- uh, VSC, whatever. But it should never have happened. That That's the thing. It's nothing to do with Gasly. It's nothing to do with this or that. It should never have happened. And Sebastian Bell put it perfectly when it was put in the, the media pen and they said, we all know what happened eight years ago. And Vettel said, clearly not enough. Mm. I think that's the perfect, like, thing to say of all the places to happen as well I know. Just spit in the it's face like we even it? saw was it George Bianchi's father posting on Instagram yeah. um you know it's it's really sad and you know I, I don't blame you Casey for getting upset seeing it because you know it stirs up a lot of emotions from a very very dark day that we had um in 2014 uh just to carry on quickly because I mentioned the Gasly penalty so um that yeah the stewards actually accepted the factor of shock at seeing a a, a truck on track like they accept the fact that that was shocking. Um, so, and the FIA have also said they're going to conduct a thorough investigation, which uh, is still baffling to me that the FIA can investigate themselves and then be like, won't happen again. Yeah. And um, one, one thing I will add as well is obviously because I went in, in a bit on Sky there, which I don't normally like to do because I understand, um, you know, we're, we're in the situation as well where we chat a lot of stuff. And sometimes people don't like what comes out of our mouths and then have a go at us. But this for me was just, they were so tone deaf and it was really just bad. But shout out to um, Jensen Button and Ted who just weren't having any of it and were just like saying it how it was. Yeah, because they kept posing the question, didn't they? Uh, oh, you know, could Gasly have done anything differently? Or blah, 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 blah. And Jensen was saying, we can't see anything. Mm. Uh, he's doing his job in the car. And Ted as well. Go on, Ted. The big no guy. lights on the recovery vehicle as well. Like, you can, can barely see. You can it. paint it as well Where's... as bright yellow as you want. You're not going to see it if you can't even see a car in front of you in ten me- for ten meters. It like... says it says it all that all the screenshots on Twitter. Someone had to circle where it was just to make it even more clear yeah. because you can barely see it. And that's if you've got not rain when on you're your driving visor, past. whatever it may yeah. be. You know, it's yeah, ridiculous. So yeah, the scariest thing for me out of all of that was the lack of accountability from the FIA, but they're never going to. They're never going to put their hands up and go, well, we shouldn't have put that out there because that's not the way they work. Uh, as much as I think the fans would appreciate transparency where they go, well, this was something that we shouldn't have done and we would make changes to make sure that it never happens again. Uh, how it's happened again anyway after 2014 is beyond me. At the same track, it's just disgusting, in my opinion. Um, so I'd be very interested to see what the thorough investigation actually leads to. I I just hope it's a clear and clear cut rule clear-cut rule, sorry, that if there's cars on track, there's no recovery vehicles. But I also appreciate that I think, yes, Katie, with that team radio thing and being able to speak to the drivers, it could help if we get protesters on the track or whatever and things like that so that they can be told about that, which is, you know, completely unforeseen events. Mm. I think that could also be a a really handy uh, thing to have. So, yeah, but no recovery vehicles on track ever again unless there's no cars on track, straight up. That that is a good point, actually, about, like you say, about, uh people being on the track you mentioned that big kind of emergency button in case you mentioned it as well you know the fact that they can speak to them there and then because obviously if there's protesters on track or something crazy like that uh, even if it's not a recovery track like we said that wasn't meant to be there um the fact that say they need to get all that information out critically because something's happening it shouldn't be a case of they speak to all the teams 
and then the teams have no. to relay it like it's too late it shouldn't mm. it shouldn't take that long the technology exists now like exactly. we in can all other see FIA it championships yeah it's not like it's in british drawing cars and you've got to like it's literally in other fia championships why is it not in f1 it's meant to be the bloody pinnacle I know. I don't get it. Like, it, there's so many things in Formula One where you question why have they not invested more, to, considering we are the pinnacle, supposedly, of motorsport. Like, even when you break it down to tracks being too wet and people and marshals being out there with brooms, and you're like, this is Formula One for Christ's sake. Like, you see NASCAR and they have proper jet engine things, don't they, and things to to move the waters. But anyway, that's a different topic altogether. Uh, question: Vettel Laporte, how would you have managed the clean up job after Science's crash? Red flag. Wait for the cars to come back in the pits. Send out the recovery vehicle. Easy. Done. Like, th- there's no need for a risk. No one, by the way, is going to say, wow, FIA, why did you throw a red flag? That was easy to sort out that. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. no one's going to say that. And also, even if one person on Twitter does, who cares? Because oh, there's always one person risk. on Twitter. Don't worry. Exactly. So, yeah, we've already said it. It shouldn't should never have been there in the first place. And like like you're saying, that VSC was there, literally bought in because of the Bianchi incident, and yet on the exact same track in the exact same conditions, they didn't use it. Very odd. So because they had the safety car out, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. the safety car got deplo- deployed that relatively not... quickly. So the safety car being deployed, surely does that not activate the VSC conditions? No, because that not Gasly what the Delta can go is? to a Delta. No, because the Delta Gasly can go VSC. quicker. Yeah. Oh, so it's a different delta to what the VSC delta is. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure, but obviously you can still speed up in certain sections. Um, but you can with the VSC. Or we've seen yeah, that in Singapore. Yeah, so I, I, I'm questioning. Well, I, I think my understanding is this, the safety car being out would be the VSC conditions. I think we'd have to get that cleared up. But mm. um, yeah, so uh, I don't think he could just absolutely yeet it round. But yeah, at the same time, um, yeah. If you think that was one of the problems with um, if we throwing back to Imola 20 I can't remember it would have been 2020 maybe or 2021 when there was the marshal on the track Russell Uh, crashing behind yeah and there was the the, Mm. yeah okay 2020 so yeah there's a marshal on track uh, there's a few marshals a few marshals on track still sweeping up and the cars were going past really quick because they're allowed to zoom by and catch up the safety car even though it's still a safety car yeah so there's there's that's another problem which we won't go into because we'll be here for three days. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone's, I think, ready and camped out and wherever they're listening. Uh, let me know in the <laughs> comments, actually, where you're, where you're listening to this podcast right now. That'd be very interesting to see. Uh, that. I like seeing pictures, by the way, of people just tweeting us going, oh, I'm listening to your podcast at work and they're on like a construction site or something. And I'm like, yeah, oh, my yeah. God, people listen to this podcast. It's so yeah. weird. <laughs> I thought it was just us three having a chat every week. I know, it, it genuinely feels that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bearing in mind, Tommy absolutely hated being in front of a camera only a few years ago. And now look at him. Absolute star. Uh, right. <laughs> Next question. Team WTF member Sazzy BM. Should the communication between the safety people in the FIA during an incident be better, i.e. informing teams? I think we kind of said that to tell the drivers to go slow as there are still tractors yet. I think flags are not enough. Yeah, OK, cool. We've covered that um, very, very detailed. So I think we can move on. Any more FIA comments or are we are we done with them now and we just expect change? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we are literally done with them. Um, yeah. yeah, Katie looks like she's about to go off on another one. Uh, so my three-word race review, we move away now. And we talk about the racing. The racing the race? that happened. Oh, my, oh my God. God. Uh, my three-word race review is wets need changing. And this has been something we have known for a while now. Uh, Monaco, Imola, Sebastian Vettel, the absolute flag bearer for Formula One. That man just... He has so much knowledge, so much experience. He knows what Formula One needs. Maybe he is the future race director of Formula One. But they haven't changed anything. The wets are the worst tyre in the world. They are too hard. But even, even on lap one, right, where you you could excuse Suzuka for the River Thames in some places, it was so wet. And yet Vettel and Latifi going into the pits at the end of the restart, uh, sorry, yeah, went into the inter- uh, for intermediates and was immediately at least on the pace, the next lap quicker, Vettel faster lap, faster lap. So from a racing perspective, the wets need to change because we're just not going to see that element of strategy. We want to see in wet races, wets to inters, inters to dries, if possible. That's the, you know, that's the beautiful, perfect thing to see. 
but not only this the the thing that highlights it the the thing that's uh, a, a more important factor to talk about is the fact the wets being terrible are actually forcing the drivers into a more of an unsafe situation because they are going on to intermediates that aren't necessarily ready for those conditions but are quicker than what the wet tires are able to produce. Now, I think Vettel said, like, you know, it's on everybody on the grid who started or went on to intermediates that, oh no, th- at the beginning, sorry, this was before the crash of signs and whatever. Everyone started on intermediates because it was a standing start. That's on them, they said, but it's also on the FIA and the fact that there's there's nothing mandated here. So the difference in ruling is if there's a standing start, they can choose what they want. If it's a rolling start, they have to start on wets. But then even then, Vettel and Latifi pitted on the first mm. lap and it's went on to intermediates. <laughs> and even coming out the pits, it was so sketchy between Latifi and Vettel. And you could just see like the puddles flying up. And those intermediates are not necessarily ready for those conditions. But the reason they're so much better is because they're a softer tyre and they can generate heat quicker and they can get grip better. Whereas the wets are too hard. If you, I guess, compare it maybe to the hard and softs of dry compounds, there's a big pace difference between them. But it was even bigger. Mick Schumacher was five, six seconds a lap slower within only a few laps. The man led the race for 23 thousandths of a second <laughs> and maybe a bit more. It just it didn't uh, update quick enough. But I love the fact that he hadn't stopped and he was already passed by Verstappen after three laps or something. So I think the yeah. wets do need changing. They need to become a more viable tyre for the safety of the drivers to not be forced onto a tyre that's not ready. Uh, and also for the, the sporting uh, entertainment factor as well. Yeah, totally agree. Vettel, yeah, put it... He, Vettel, like you say, he just speaks so well. And if he doesn't end up in some kind of role, which he may not, because you know part of him leaving, obviously, was the fact that he went to be his family and stuff. He just speaks so well. And he, he acknowledges every bit of like hypocrisy and everything in what he's saying as well. Because, yeah, he mentioned the fact that the the start of the race... Sorry to go back to that again. For the start of the race, everyone was on the intermediate tires. And realistically, it should have been wet tires to clear the water and so you didn't aquaplane. But there's but he was saying there's too much pressure on you to go for the inters. Because at the end of the day, the Formula One drivers, if you give them a choice of oh, you might spin off on the inters and it's probably very risky and a bit dangerous probably pretty dangerous to be honest uh sorry on the wets um and you're better or you go on the the inters and it's dangerous yeah and you're going to be five seconds quicker they're going to take the it's Mm. dangerous you're probably going to crash but you're going to be five seconds a lot quicker every single driver is going to do that every under no illusion that if the safety car if that wasn't a written rule about being on the wet tires to start that race everyone would have been on the inters behind the safety car 100 percent and that's just not right. What what is that tire like? Why? It's just it's just baffling the fact that it can be that much slower. That in absolute yeah like monsoon appalling conditions, they all want to go in on the very first lap to the point where you know it was that much better that it got. I mean Nicholas Latifi two points. That's how much better it was. So <laughs> it's, it's it's insane. And the wets, yeah, again, they're just useless. I do sympathize greatly with Pirelli because having to design tires and make compounds can't be an easy job. But it's I'm guessing job. it is their it is their <laughs> they've job. They've had a very long time to get wet tires, yeah. right? It is true. But then when it comes to like doing the tire tests, maybe like we saw it in, it might have been Barcelona, where they had to simulate a wet track and they brought all these trucks out and stuff like that to simulate wet weather, like tire testing. Um, but generally, you're going to get less testing in those kind of conditions because most of the time, you know, you can set a date and go somewhere hot and sunny and it will be dry and all that kind of stuff. So the slicks are normally probably better tested than the wet tires. I'm just making that assumption. I don't know if it's true or not. But we had a tire test planned for this weekend in Japan. I put as my podcast prediction that there was going to be rain and it was going to delay a session. And I didn't look at the weather forecast. I just know that normally when we go to Japan, it's like rainy season. Why did they not have that? Yeah. Why did they not have that in mind when they were doing the tire testing? Why did they not take 
a chunk of wet weather tires because we clearly still need improvements and the dries and then they could test the tires depending on what kind of condition it was going to be because like you say i don't know how else we're going to get a better extreme wet compound than just having all of this testing because you're totally right we should it should be that we get a wet race and we can firstly actually race and do it unlike we saw in singapore but that yeah we go from having several laps on the extreme wets and it's exciting and it's thrilling and you know it's doing the job of making the racing better and then go to the intermediates and then go to the slicks it shouldn't have to be oh god we've got to dig out the extreme wets from the very back of the garage and like put them on the car and then they get seen for like half or a lap and then they're switched over that shouldn't be the case so i don't know what the answer is from pirelli but they need to do something. Also, just want to point out the absolute irony of doing a video about how full wets are never used. And then the very next race, like it was just... They were used for on. all of about three kind of laps. So I think yeah. it was still uh, very much an absolute... <laughs> it kind of video, proved your it? point. Yeah. Whilst mm. also kind of, yeah, on hindsight, it was like, ironic. oh, ironic. Well, look, yeah. The yeah. only reason they were used was because the rules said they had to be used, right? Yeah. It wasn't because they wanted to be used. They wanted um, to spite you. But no, I completely agree with your point, Katie, that it is much easier to test dry tyres uh, than it is wet because they can just go to a dry, hot country and test the tyres. Um, but look, we have enough rain in, in, in England. I'm sure they can, uh, if they really wanted to, just go to Silverstone uh, during winter and they will get rain. Uh, but it is very, it's much more difficult to, to plan around that, isn't it? Um, so Ayrton PS comes in with the question, how about making it mandatory for the teams to join Pirelli to develop usable full wet tyres? Pirelli boss told Brazilian reporter Mary Becker that Pirelli cannot properly develop their wet tyres because teams have no interest in them, only in slicks. Oh, yes. I think because we've already highlighted this, not just a sporting matter, it's a safety matter as well. So there needs to be a commitment from teams. Absolutely. If that's what Pirelli need is laps from teams, then they need to sort it out. And it takes a lot of water, by the way, if they want to artificially uh, make a that's whole what I mean. wet. But let's just make, I don't know the shortest track possible wet. <laughs> and then, and secure like, outer yeah, circle. Yeah, or maybe not Monaco. secure. Let's not, let's Monaco not go to Bahrain. <laughs> That's not usually the uh, coldest of countries. Um, but yeah, it it definitely, there, there, there needs to be something done. I don't know what the ideal situation is, but I'm sure Pirelli are calling for that as well as the teams. Some of them probably want to make sure that it is a, a safer environment for their, for their drivers. So I, I look forward to seeing uh, what happens uh, with that. Um, anything to add on that? I guess I'd just say the fact that when we saw the wets, they were, even though they were very slow and let's be honest, if Vettel hadn't put on the Inters straight away and Latifi, people might have stayed out with them a bit longer because at the end of the day, if you take lap time out of it, and this is the problem that F1 drivers and teams will always go to lap time, but if you just take that out for a second, they were racing, no one was aquaplaning off, it was clearing the water. So realistically, they were doing, uh, they showed that Formula One can race in those conditions with a wet tire. It's just the problem is Formula One drivers will always take that risk if there's a tire that's five, six, seven, eight laps quicker, even if there's a risk element to it. So, yeah, maybe yeah, we'll have absolutely. to bring in a rule to say like you have to have the wet tires on for minimum three laps or something like that to help clear the water. I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer yeah, is. Yeah, that's a difficult, difficult thing to to put down, isn't it? If there's varying levels of water, because then everyone uh, will also uh, come in at the same time. And if it's time. slightly <laughs> raining, or maybe it starts raining and then they're fair, like no, they stay out for another two more laps. Sorry, it started raining it again. Did make it, more rain. it did make it really fascinating conditions. So the fact that you had everyone on the wets, then you had that tie gamble of people on the inters, even though. Obviously, we're complete. Like we're saying that, like realistically, you shouldn't be going on the inters here, but it's quicker, so people will. And then, you know, we had that situation where you had the top three being Alonso, Ricardo, and Mick Schumacher, <laughs> and even we were on the watch long saying if they red flag this, and that's the podium, that is insane. Um, I would have accepted that's what that. They, I would have oh accepted that. Oh my <laughs> gosh! Imagine. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Been the best podium ever. It would have been. You but would. The poor fans. Um, at least they got yeah. to see, see a race in the end. But yeah, some, some bit of a race. And then even, even the fact that the Inters, again, they're just actually talking about the race that happened. Uh, how dare we? Um, dare we? It was it was a fascinating race as well because we got to see the Inters and then 
do put on inters again and fly through the field because it's so much quicker, but it's really hard to overtake. Well, it would have been nice to have just a few more minutes, wouldn't it? Because Yeah, a few more minutes for Verstappen to time. drive even further away uh, from the rest <laughs> of the field. What I found really interesting, actually, talking about the tyres, um, was once again, Ferrari struggle with tyre wear. And oh, big time. They, they, they generate heat into those tires very quickly and it is almost a carbon copy every single race we have where the first five six seven laps maybe leclerc looks quick quicker than verstappen he's on the back of him he's like oh maybe well i'm like oh maybe this week red uh, ferrari will be quicker than red bull but then it's always that next part next phase of the race when they settle in Verstappen gets more tire temperature, more grip, and then he just drives away. And the tire wear on that Red Bull compared to the Ferrari, so different. I saw a picture side by side between Verstappen's front tires and Leclerc's front tires for the intermediates at the end of the race. It was night and day. There were pretty decent grooves still left on Verstappen's tire. Leclerc's down the middle was almost slick. Like, <laughs> no wonder he's struggling. The, oh, yeah, no wonder he's struggling because it's still reasonably wet and at the end of the race. And no wonder he probably locked up as well because he had a almost half slick tire. So is it really interesting to see the, the different uh, tire wear levels because it's even more important, I suppose, in, in wet conditions. Uh, and no wonder Leclerc was asking on the radio as well. Shall, can I can I box? Where, where will I end up if uh, if I boxed? And maybe that could have even been a better strategy for Ferrari. We don't know. Um, but yeah. Interesting. Next question. Kid Justice 21. Should the race have started earlier? I get that the organisers want the event to be near the end of the season and later race means more Europeans can watch, but I find it insane that the race's three hour time window meant the race ended at night locally. Well, I guess not at night, but the sunset goes down very quickly, doesn't it, in Japan? It started it like... by five. Yeah. So it's it's a very early sunset. It... I understand that there is a, a difficulty here of trying to get Europeans to wake up at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. or 6 a.m. or whatever. Um, what they need to do is just not race in monsoon season, really. <laughs> and then they don't probably have to worry about this uh, three-hour uh, time clock that they have. I, I don't agree that they should have done it on the whim and seen, ah, the weather, uh, it looks like it could be a bit bad. Let's roll it back an extra two hours or something because i understand that it's not just about that it's the scheduling it's the fact that they've you know you're not going to be able to imagine get waking up at like 5 a.m ready to put it on and it's like oh it's already halfway through the race I've exactly half of it. yeah like, you're not you're not, not gonna have, not everyone has social media not everyone is always up to date with timing changes so i understand yeah. why they didn't do it on the on the fly um but maybe i don't know i don't they won't because they've always raced haven't they at this kind of time of year for for japan um there is so. talk about why um apparently that formula one have been pushing to do an earlier start because one it's not in monsoon oh. season oh early, then... oh, right. i think earlier is in time i was like no no sorry <laughs> 3 a.m next earlier, year <laughs> earlier in like um yeah. april like an april time uh is the one that f1 actually want because one better conditions to cherry blossom in japan which is cool <laughs> um because you know um and yeah the fact that they want that, but then the circuit organisers don't because it's traditional. But then these poor fans that it's like oh. a, a washout and stuff. And back to the point about should it have started earlier? Yes, in terms of make the time earlier. Um, obviously, don't do it at the last second and go, oh, it's going to rain. We should do it. But <laughs> I personally think that it's just a case of like deal with it, European fans. You have to get up a bit early. Formula One is a world championship. People watch from all over the world. And if if I have to get up at four instead of five for two races a year, so what? Like I'd much rather that than the you know, the poor fans that have had to mm, miss, do that, every miss race. do that every race, sit in the pouring rain. And then this this whole three hour window, and I know it ended uh and, and part of this is again because the light. They, they run it so late to try and help with the European time that it means that the light's going. But those poor fans that had to wait in the rain for hours and then don't get a full race because at the end of the day, they're just because it cuts off at that timer, there was still a bit of light and 
it shouldn't have to end that they only get to see a 40 minute race when the track is now dry enough to actually have racing it's it's a bit odd for me but yeah i think they should just d- deal with the times like it's a world championship and maybe this is something they do end up doing because at the end of the day it's not just a european thing anymore formula uh, i guess as well if if you're gonna rate if you're gonna watch it at 5 a.m you'll probably watch it at 4 a.m oh 100 like, oh, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, what, you're either what committed does it really to it make? or you're not um you do wonder whether they they'd race in the morning japanese time which would then mean europeans watch it at like midnight which is not far off i mean we're gonna be watching uh Vegas. qualifying for the us gp this um sorry ne- next weekend um at 11 p.m so maybe there's a way that, that they race in the morning i don't know but then again there's a lot of things that have to happen before the race and then is it too early for fans i can see where it's a difficult uh balancing act but i think yeah putting it back an extra hour that's not gonna really affect too much but i'm sure the big wigs at uh all of their scheduling and whatever and sky etc will have their own opinions on that um yeah if if you wanted to do it reactively as well it's not really going to work. Like I say, for people that are tuning in, are going to miss it um, because the idea was always there's going to be rain on Sunday. Like we knew that, but the talk was it will happen towards the very end of the race, if not be missed out completely and it will rain after the race. But obviously weather is, although we like to try and forecast it and predict it, can be very unpredictable. So it came earlier. Um, you can't just, and I say this as, you know, not just because I'm European and I didn't want to like turn on my TV at, like I said, five o'clock and find that the race is finished and it's over and whatever. But yeah, there are so many people around the world that rely on this schedule that gets put out a year in advance. You can't just suddenly turn around and go, oh, let's race earlier. It's just, it's not really going to work. Um, like, especially if it's a European race and it will mess up with the US audience or the Australian audience, and New Zealand's or whatever, like, it's just not really plausible, but sometimes it's gone rain. We just got to deal with it. But when we raced in Malaysia, for example, that always seemed to happen when it was really rainy. Um, and, you know, Tommy, you mentioned about moving it to April because of cherry blossom and all this kind of stuff. Also, that's when we've got other Asian races. We've got China in April. We've got Australia sort of March, April. Like it would make sense logistically on the calendar as well. But um phew. I don't know but I think this every year and I remember I used to say about Japan and like I said Malaysia and stuff that we'd always go there and it would always rain I'd be like why do they actually do it (laughs) like why don't they just move it but maybe it's not that easy yeah maybe the Japanese organizers like to have a race towards the end of the season because there's maybe championship connotations and and whatnot Um, I mean Max Max Verstappen was literally crown champion at their circuit so there are benefits of having um, a a race towards the end of the year uh, for sure maybe uh, you know we came up with a thing about the FIA being able to speak to all the drivers maybe every F1 fan gets an earpiece and then the race director can let us know if the race is going earlier so if you just ship it out to 700 billion so fans I have to or whatever sleep it is. with an earpiece in yeah. when I go to bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, come on, Casey. The, the commitment you've done to the W7 website anyway, I'm sure that an earpiece I, I mean, that's fine, true. Right? I literally on other days <laughs> I had to go to bed at 11, wake up at 1 for the Gasly, Gasly uh, De Vries announcement, back to sleep, up again at 3, back to sleep, <laughs> up again at 5. Like Just power naps. Yeah. That's all it was. Yeah, it really was. Love that's it. That's probably why I'm so delusional. Next question, Simon Ingebrand. As a fairly recent F1 fan, I'm wondering if it's common for races to rain away like we've seen at Spa and during this weekend. Or were teams more ready to strap on the full wets and go for it until just recently? Um, I don't really... um... We've definitely raced in worse conditions than what we saw yesterday. But we haven't raced in worse conditions for quite a while than yesterday i'd say in terms of i don't remember the last time actual racing racing levels of spray you know like the the iconic camera of just cutting to a camera and seeing absolutely nothing and then a car just goes yeah Uh, i don't remember that for quite some time yeah Mm. i feel like brazil like 2016 vibes kind of yeah but yeah wet races that germany was crazy in 2019 but it was nowhere near that level of spray i would i would argue Um, kind of hung in the air in, in Suzuka. But yeah, it's mainly because of the wets, it yeah. seems now. If you get a good wet tyre, we might see more of that because surprisingly, most of the drivers managed to... I mean, the they were, they were only, all fine. We had yeah. two DNFs. <laughs> two in those conditions where... And they were at the start, yes. which again... And Albans was, was they were, technical. 
Yeah. Albums was technical and sites went off, which we've kind of alluded to the fact that they shouldn't really been on Inters at the start. So yeah, and also proves that the drivers are very, very good and can deal with these conditions very well. Okay, cool. Next question. J. Maori Maldonado. What the hell is Latifi doing up there? <laughs> All right, savage. Don't speak about from Maldonado. Latifi. Promoted himself from P21 to P20 in the Drivers' Championship. So go on, Latifi. And look, memes aside, the guy actually had a great race. <laughs> he, he, he 19th on the grid, had a five-place penalty, which affected his grid position absolutely nothing, and rolled the dice with Vettel, stayed on the track with those intermediate tyres, and then his pace was better than Norris behind. And all of a sudden, Latifi's saying, well, when the Williams gets up there, it's actually a very hard car to pass. He may well have been spitting facts. But uh, Latifi, yeah, li- too little, too late. Can you imagine, Williams? Resigns Nicholas Latifi after a great two points. at uh, And two points as well. We thought it was going to be one, maybe even half a point. But he finished ninth, didn't he? He did. Which was fantastic achievement. So, yeah, Latifi had a great race, genuinely. Go on, the lad. That's one of the things, actually, that I was like, oh, we're full points awarded. Because I was doing a tweet and loads of people were saying Latifi's in the points, like, pl- like as in he's getting points plural. And I was like, oh, but is he not just getting one? And I then guess you'd I still like, say points, though, wouldn't you? Would go. He's in the point. This sounds like True. a predict. This sounds like a <laughs> prediction. Uh, our own kind yeah. of uh, interpretation of the <laughs> yeah. rules of the predictions. Where like, well, technically, you said point. Yeah, yeah because when Lance Stroll's tenth, you don't go. Oh, he's in the point. <laughs> That's <laughs> <Yeah>. true. <laughs> but like, if you were, if you were getting Correct. half points, then if you finished tenth, you wouldn't get a point. It's, oh, or did you get half a point? You would have got half is a it? point. Yeah, half a point. Okay. Michael Mask is that you? Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> finished tenth. Half of Don't one is zero. Ever compare me. No. I told you I can't do basic maths. Yeah, what would um, have been, I guess what would have been a seventy-five percent? Because oh my you know, god, they, imagine they have them different tiers, to right? So what yeah. would the tenth been like? One point seven five of a point? I don't know. Oh um, dear, that would have been so yeah. ugly for the maths graphics. Um, but yeah, Latifi, great drive from him. Clearly, it's something to do with. Um, maybe wet conditions because he got his last points in Hungary when it was damp. So fair play to you, lad. Well done. Obviously, you provide us with some great entertainment when you took that accidental wrong turn earlier in the week. Um, How's and... he scored points? His only points of the year was the the, the place where he got lost. Well, know, if that's wild, not hero, uh, zero to hero, then there we go. Oh, I love his Nutella. Um, <laughs> the the points actually, the two points is the same, even in the fifty percent category uh, i was hoping to never see those columns again but i just googled it um yeah we- it was a weird race the fact that the inters were so much better that it again flipped it uh flipped the race on its head really with anyone that pitted early but yeah credit to him that kept on the track and did well and um he said himself that even if this had come before he'd not lost his seat then it wouldn't have made a difference because he had himself admitted it needed to be about consistency, not just getting one good result. So too little, too late for him, but nice, nice points. He no longer has to finish behind Nick DeVries in the title because he's ahead of him. So that's good, good work. Love to see that. Next question. Rishike. Did Vettel benefit because of his spin? Yes, probably. I don't imagine he would have pitted. Uh, well, I, I, people are saying because of his spin, he literally turned into Alonso. Let's let's uh, <laughs> say that first, right? He didn't just spin on his own. He quite lucky, I suppose, that both Alonso and uh, himself didn't have any sort of suspension damage from Vettel just turning <laughs> straight into. It felt like very F one game lobby esque, where he just like ah, I've just turned yeah, in and see weird. if I can get around the corner. Obviously, he had no visibility. I'm not blaming Vettel at all. It's just uh, just one of those things. Um, but yeah, absolutely benefited from it, and the Tifi as well obviously benefited from being terrible at qualifying. So those two rolled the dice, made it happen. I was kind of hoping that no one pitted for five, six laps. So it would have been a Vettel Latifi one, two, but unfortunately it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. It was ironic that Vettel's mistake actually helped him because if he'd been, obviously he was brilliant in qualifying. And if he hadn't have gone off, he'd have, I don't know if he'd have, he probably wouldn't have gambled like he did because the people at the back gambled. Um, so yeah, ironically it did help him. One thing that, um, sorry, K to cover your ears now, but I was just thinking about this in the fact that people's race, how people's races changed, and you make your own luck in Formula One. But 
when you've got no luck at all. The fact that Daniel Ricciardo managed to have a good start, get ahead of Lando, and then what that only meant was the fact that Lando could take the risk because he was at the back and it leapfrogged him ahead of Ricardo, and Ricardo stayed out because he was higher up and then it didn't work. It just sums up, obviously it's not been quick, but when your luck's not in, it just sums up his time at McLaren really, doesn't it? As Lance Stroll once said, sometimes you love the sport and it just doesn't love you back. And also probably worth mentioning Danny Rick not on the grid next year. That was uncalled yeah. for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just thought I'd say This is just because... Daniel Ricciardo pain corner. It is, it's horrible. I can't believe Vettel and Ricciardo will not be on the grid next year. My two favourites. I mean, like at least do it. And Latifi. Yeah, and maybe Mick. I'm just going to have to be supporting Esty Besty and Checo yeah. next year. Four, four world championships between them. That was also really mean. <laughs> what have no, I done to deserve sad, this? Right? I'm going to be awfully sad when Danny Rick leaves. He, he's my absolute favourite. Um, obviously, not just sport, obviously, Leclerc, but we have it. Danny Rick, we've spent quite a bit of time with him and he's an absolute legend. Uh, anyway, we're, we're sidetracked. Uh, Tommy, it's time to play the jingle. It is. Okay. Hello there. I'm a Japanese lo-fi creator that goes by the name of Incho. I usually compose chilled, sleepy beats for Spotify. However, being an avid listener to you three, I thought I'd potentially come up uh, uh, with... Sorry, I thought I should try and quickly rustle up a potential sound for the ABCDEF1 segment with a Japanese twist. I apologize with how rough and ready it is, but I hope you enjoy. Keep up the fantastic work and have a lovely day. Oh, you too. Here we go. I love that. I love that. I, I love absolutely that. love that. I, that's amazing. Um, I love that people are sending like race appropriate ones as well. Yeah, that's incredible. That's awesome. In show was that? that yes. Well, thank you very much. That was that was awesome. Really enjoyed that. Very apt for for this Grand Prix. So really enjoyed that. Um, okay, ABCDF one time. Let's do this, Lewis Hamilton. B. B. Cool, and a B from the fans. Easy. George Russell. C. C. Ah, uh, oh no. Mm, no, B, because he got screwed over with the strategy and then came back through and actually did some amazing overtakes. So I'm going to give him a B. He did do some great overtakes, actually. Yeah. I'll go B as well, because he was about the only person providing us overtakes in that. And that beautiful sprint. move in the S's twice was was brilliant. That was very much like Verstappen at Brazil on Rosberg esque, where he just found a different line, went around the outside. Thank you very much. You sticking with a C, Tommy? Sure am. It's graceful. Uh, okay, <laughs> so a B from us and a C from the fans. Uh, Max Verstappen, A-star. A-star. Yeah. The most conclusive A-star of the year when it comes to the grades. 90.2% of you voted A-star. 8.3% oh. voted A. I can't believe anyone voted B or below, but that's just polls, isn't it? There's always one that goes, ha, I'm going to give him an F. <laughs> uh, Sergio Perez, A. A, yeah. A, yeah. Another good drive. Yep. Forced Leclerc into a mistake on the final lap. Uh, an A from us and an A from the fans. Charles Leclerc. B. B. Yeah, B. yeah I'll go for a B. Mm. Mm. Yeah, B. Uh, okay, B from us and a B from the fans. Carlos Sainz. D. I mean, D? Yeah. Yeah, I think D's probably fair. One of the only ones to have binned it. And the only one threw away fourth. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, a shame for signs, but he just isn't confident in the wet, is he? In that Ferrari car, he just he was nowhere in Singapore compared to Leclerc's pace, and then lost it on lap one. So, um, yeah, it's going to have to be. Is it even worse than the D? Because he's the only one that crashed. I'm going to have to give him an E, just because, like we've we've given E's in the past for people crashing out. So. Mm. It's difficult though because it's aquaplaning as well. Like sometimes the even the best aquaplane, and then once you do, you, you're literally a passenger. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd yeah, aquaplane, fine. But everyone else was going through exactly the same part of the track, so I, I don't know. That, that's why I'm giving it any. 
I'm looking at the split of the vote, actually. It's very, very torn. 30% C, fan votes, 28% D, 13% E, 18% F, and 8% B. B? B? It's 8% a drive. Carlos Sainz fans. We did a great oh, half it's borderline lap. E, isn't it? Yeah, That's I think really, E. Yeah. yeah. If five cars had gone off and crashed, understandable, mm. give him a C. But yeah, like, true. he's the only one to have binned it, so it's going to have to be an E. Uh, you going with an E as well, Tommy? Yeah. Uh, Katie, are you changing yours? Are you, stay with the D. Mm, it's a low D. Oh, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. Okay, E from us and a C from the fans. Uh, 30%, as Tommy says, uh, C, but then it was split 28% D. And then there's a combined 31% for E and F as well. So uh, a lot of uh, mixed grades there. Uh, Lando Norris got quite lucky. With the, mm. We're not lucky. Obviously, he made the strategy work just like Latifi did and, and whatnot. Um, but it wasn't that quick, so I'm going to see. see. Yeah, see. Got one point in the end uh, and finished just a couple of seconds ahead of Danny Rick. Uh, so, yeah, a C for from us and a C from the fans. Uh, Danny Rick, I'm going to have to give a C as well. Yeah. What yeah. could it be? But C. Uh, and a C from the fans. Uh, Fernando Alonso finished seventh, 11 thousandths of a second behind Vettel. Hmm. They had an amazing drag to the line which we uh, never saw on the broadcast we never saw after. and not even a replay uh, no. the only thing i've seen of it is a fan footage or a, a rear facing of vettel where you can't really tell what's happening really tell. yeah so there's no off board of it so it's probably why they didn't show it very well it's a shame. But awesome but i think alonso yeah, i'm gonna alonso. give a b b yeah yeah yeah, yeah b yeah b from us and an a from the fans um, Esteban Ocon, A star, A star, Esty <laughs> Besty. Amazing. This may sound mad when he won a race, but that is hands down the best performance of his career by a country mile. And like, I know you said like Verstappen's uh, was like the easiest A star, but for me that's easy A star. He doesn't, and I'm guilty of this, not giving him enough credit, but to out qualify a Mercedes and then beat a Mercedes in the race. Still can't get a midfield podium, can we? But um, amazing drive from Ocon. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Uh, well done, Ocon. Uh, I think his season, he's just being slept on, genuinely. He is one of the most underrated drivers on the grid, uh, especially this season. I think he's been showing that, okay, he could actually lead this Alpine team and lead them to some serious success because he is... He's doing a brilliant job this year um, and scored some some healthy points for the for the team. So, uh, yeah, great shout. Uh, great performance from, from Ocon. Uh, so an A-star from us and an A-star from the fans. Uh, Pierre Gasly, 17th. Uh, Future teammate of Esteban as well now. So he got, obviously got caught up. I don't know where he exactly was when he hit that. Um, the board. Sponsor board. At the back. At the back, he yeah, because he was starting from the pit Oh, okay. All oh, right, yeah. Um out in Q1. Uh, I know he had a it's gonna bit be of a, a break D. problem, but it's a it was not D. a good weekend. Yeah. yeah, I'll go for a D. Okay, D from us and a C from the fans. Yuki Sonoda, C. He's another one that was very unlucky, like because of of course I'm doing this because it's Yuki, but of course you are. I'm I'm glad he didn't get points because he was one of those people, a bit like Ricardo, that was the victim of being high up, which meant you didn't take the gamble, and then you dropped all the positions behind the people that lapped earlier, which is annoying. It's so, C. Wow, it's he went a for B. a B. Okay, yeah. interesting. 13th and gives him a B. That is some serious bias. Right well, he it. beat his teammate by considerable margin, and he's in an alpha tower, you see. But then his teammate started the pit lane. But anyway, uh, we move. C for from us. Him, would have you. C from us star. <laughs> and a C from the fans. Sebastian Vettel, A star. A star. A. Spun off on the first oh. one. You can't, you can't give an A star for someone that... Literally ruined it. got oh, that. oh, Tommy, why have you said that? <laughs> why have you ruined it with facts? No. Yeah. This, this, is, this, fun, is, Tommy. this is why. This is why Vettel ends up like so Getting... far ahead of everyone else like in our end of season review because we give him like a bit extra because he's Sebastian Vettel but at okay, the end of the day me. he's made a mistake um, and it's oh, played into his hands somewhat. you are so naughty it's an A <laughs> it's an A fair enough I got blinded by the fact that he was had a great race but 
fair enough. He did turn into Alonso, mm. and that was a mistake. I know the visibility is bad, but he did he did turn in quite aggressively into that corner, didn't he? And to be fair, how close was he, by the way, to just clipping the grass on the left hand side and just binning it into the ball? Like he had a couple of moments where he was like, Whoa! and just stepped out a tiny bit. He must have been millimeters away from hitting that grass. Um, okay, A A for Vettel. Uh, that is a very fair point. Well, sorry, Vettel fans. I love <laughs> yeah. it. Tommy's like. Yuki Tsunoda, B. <laughs> and then realistic for, for someone like Vettel. No, only an A, but fair enough. Uh, Hi. So an A from us and an A star from the fans. Lance Stroll. What a start. Like, yeah, star. what a A star for the start. A star, star, star. Are we breaking it down now, are we? We're breaking it down to. Well, I mean, it was phenomenal. I'm a fairly big critic of it sometimes on this podcast, but. As somebody said on Twitter, Daddy Cash does not buy having the balls to go down the inside. It was like on that line that he took. I guess he just sent it, didn't he? To the was... floor. Like anything could have happened. Somebody could have twitched. It would have been a disaster, but it wasn't. It was amazing. So I'm just really like buzzing about that start. Okay, B. But I'm probably, yeah, going to give him a... Oh, he's finished 12, C. though. Yeah. It was, what, three seconds off the points? Qualified. Uh, I see. 19th. Yeah, that's the I reason why he sent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To be fair, we can't what give him be, grace because no? of the because of the start. Um, okay, C from us and a C from the fans. Nicholas Latifi, I am giving him an A star. I don't care uh, for him. <laughs> all right, this is an A star, mm. and I don't care what anyone says. Yeah, probably the last one he's ever going to get. Care. So. Yeah, I was going to say I'm you're giving him an A star. A, he's but... never getting an A star ever again. So pretty sure we say, say that every time he does a slightly decent performance that we're like, <laughs> he'll never get an A-star again. So he deserves an A-star. I don't think we ever gave him an A-star, did we? Pretty sure. Must have given him one in Hungary. Hungary. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah, sure. Okay. But this time I think he had, I think he genuinely drove like an A-star performance for Nicholas Zatifi. Yeah, for Nicholas Zatifi. Not because he's yeah. in a Williams, just for no. himself. Yeah. Yeah. What, Tommy, are we going for? It's still an A, but yeah. It's gotta be he nice. Loves he loves the teller though. <laughs> you just gotta be nice sometimes, you know. Like these grades mean absolutely nothing. All right, this is for Latifi. Okay, um, he went the wrong way and then turned it around and got an, uh, got got points. It's like, literally. Unbelievable. And to be fair, he he had some minerals to hold off Lando at the end. And um, yeah, I'm giving him an A star. I don't care. Uh, are you going with A star? Well? Okay, to you. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. A star from us and an A from the fans. Uh, Alex. Right on, fans. <laughs> no. <laughs> The fans, t- wait, the I, fans I am absolutely you taking, yeah, I am absolutely taking into account, absolutely taking into account that he is not racing ever again, and I'm just being nice. I would genuinely give him an A, but I don't care. A star, right? <laughs> People are going to get angry, aren't they? They're like, "Oh no, but the grades, the grades are skewed." Oh, the chief is going to finish last week. Yeah. The 20th. Yeah. Oh, I feel torn now. But anyway, it's fine. I'm going to commit to it. Uh, Alex fans. Albon <laughs> obviously had a problem. Oh, See. yeah. But it was caused because yeah, of contact. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll go see. Was it? What was the contact? Uh, he hit K-Mag and I think it pierced a radiator or something. Oh. Oh. Wow, mm. K-Mag D. being hit rather than the other ty- other way around. How the tables have Oh, turned. I didn't know that then. Yes, yeah, so it's a D. Mm, D. Okay, D from us and a C from the fans. Bottas. Valtteri Bottas, 15th. God, the Alfa Romeo. Mate. Dreadful. Mm. Awful. What have happened what, to them? What has happened to them? Yeah. Uh, D. Yeah. D. Yeah, D. And we know how bad Bottas is in the rain as well, don't we? So, mm. uh, yeah, D from us and a C from the fans. Uh, Xiao Guan Yu had a spin at the start. It's going to be a D as well. Yeah. Got fastest it's lap. Half a second behind. Yeah, it's did he? It's D. Yeah, he did. He got fastest lap. Oh, well done, crazy, Joe. isn't it? That, that just showed those inters. Oh, it would have been so fascinating for a bit more time and see who would gamble and get through the field but yeah alas alas we did not uh k mag 14th c c yeah yeah c uh c from us and c from the fans good move at the one yeah, it was actually. It was very, very nice. Actually, was that on Lance Stroll? Or something? I feel like maybe I think it was on. Aston yeah, it was Martin. on an Aston Martin. Yeah, it wouldn't have been Vettel, so it must have been Stroll. Uh, and Mick Schumacher, obviously, rolled <laughs> Led the, the dice. race a star. <laughs> rolled the dice. I appreciate the fact that Haas have kind of gone for a McLaren strategy in Singapore, where they've got an extra lap, actually an extra few laps on the wet tires, didn't they? Uh, which didn't work out at all. Probably their only way 
opportunity of getting points. So I don't really want to downgrade them too much for that. Uh, but he finished last, so it's going to have to be a D. And he wrote off another car. He did, yes. Yeah. Oh no, he did. Well, we're taking practice into account now. God, we're savage. I think you. I think you have to if you wrote off another car. Sprinkling of practice onto the grade. Okay, D from us and a C from the fans. Okay, Suzuka predictions. This is where it's going to get heated, everybody. So strap (laughs) yourselves in. Leclerc tenth pole of the year. I can't believe I've missed out by one hundredth of a second. I think that's half a point. No. Okay. Silence is telling. And Red Bull Special Livery had a Honda sticker oh, on the no. side and no. on the nose as well, I believe. Mm-hmm. So that is half a point. And I'm not I'm not saying no, come on. Go give me half a point for that. What do you, you can think? Have half a point if my, get if I'm getting point. half a point later as well. What, because he didn't win the title for a very small month? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm get I'm I look the Red Bull special livery. I didn't say how special. I just said special. And having Honda back is, on there is special for it Honda. It's different. It's a different Red livery. Bull. Yeah, it's a different livery to what they've had so far this year. So it's I not think... a different livery. It's a different sticker. Yeah, which is a different. But it livery. affects the livery. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very. Thank you, Katie's on my side. But then I'm going to say a special livery for McLaren next week Katie, because they have a new sticker on the car every. I've got you on your prediction, all right, Katie. So, yeah, I mean, I already right. had that anyway, but thanks. Cool. No, no, that's fine. I've got you. So half a point for me. Cool. Right, Katie, you, yours. Um, I said another session will be delayed due to ever. Nope. Wasn't delayed. Started on time. <laughs> Are you joking? <laughs> no, <laughs> it started on time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it had a delay in the ra- in the race. Yeah, but you can't. And they you delayed can't... the start procedure. I'm sorry, Katie's getting a point for that. Really? Yes, because we literally had the session will be delayed. It doesn't say the start of the session will be delayed. It says the session will be delayed. The race session was absolutely delayed. So if if there's a red flag in the middle of a Grand Prix, it's a delayed session. No, but the rain delayed the restart of the race. It was a two-hour delay. But it was a red flag. Yeah, it was a red flag because the rain was delayed. The weather was delaying (laughs) us. Like (laughs) this is going to be controversial. Can we um, get Michael Massey on to? His interpretation of what he'll this find is. he'll find a line that you've written somewhere in the rule book of the WTF one. Another uh, session will be delayed due to weather. Mm, yeah, it's I guess you can, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, Tommy. Uh, you could I, you could argue maybe a media session after the race was delayed as well. They might have said Ricardo interview at five o'clock that's, and that's it had stretch. to be at six. Wait, it's still the session. Sorry, that's it. That's it. It's still that's, the session. That's a big, that's a big stretch. <laughs> Um, so yes, a point for you for that, Katie. And then you've 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 smashed it this week. I'm like that Hamilton baseball gif. Uh, we see a fan dressed head to toe as an F1 driver. That happened. And can I just say, I mentioned it on my Instagram yesterday. I felt like I was a celebrity this weekend. My oh. notifications were going mad. I must have had at least two hundred plus people messaging me and tagging me in pictures so i just want to say thank you so much because it's really sweet that you thought of me for that um so yeah there we go i got a point Woo-hoo! good time tommy uh verstappen <laughs> doesn't win the title which technically he did according <laughs> to the formula one twitter instagram and everyone apart no. from michael massey no no Very chance <laughs> okay and mercedes podium how are you going to stretch that one? Uh, because <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Jensen Fair. Button appeared on the podium, and he drove a McLaren Mercedes. You could somehow. Oh, thanks, Katie. Yeah, one point. Thank you. <laughs> 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 it's not working. And the fans, Ty Kangas thirty, both Astons out in Q one. Nope, because uh, Sebastian Vettel continued his Q3 streak at Suzuka, even in that dustbin. Uh, Jade and Ock, micking the points. Absolutely not. And Azteca lad, Merck front row. No. USA predictions. I haven't finished my second <laughs> one because uh, I just remembered I hadn't put mine in. So let's start with you, Katie. Oh, oh my God. I've gone for Daniel Ricciardo going full US. So this has got two points. Go on. No, you, you, go first. you go first. Go on. So... This includes two things because I thought I'd make it a little bit challenging. So at some point over the weekend, he's got to be pictured in in a cowboy hat. And he's also got to have his um, facial hair that he does like something different with his facial hair. I don't think he's going to. I don't know. 
Might is he, it could be his doing, because, last weekend in the in Yeah, but that Texas. also might mean that he doesn't want to like be a bit wacky and weird because he's actually quite sad that he's not going to be on the grid. Or he's going to ham it up because he's Daniel Ricciardo. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to mention is that I really wish I'd done this now and I don't know how I could have got away with it because I would have put it in the sheet. But not just saying this, I was going to make the prediction that Katie would predict that Daniel Ricciardo would have special facial hair. <laughs> That's amazing. amazing. Because I thought oh, of it as well. Yeah, and you can't get like, a point now. No, Katie. No, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get a point. Uh mine is one Red Bull, one Ferrari, and one Merc on the page. Did you say your second one? I haven't finished Katie. my oh, second sorry, one. Sorry, oh, sorry, that's all right. Tommy just jump in the gun. That's fine. Sorry, right, carry on. No, Tommy, you go. No, no, you go. It's because okay. you've got two points this week that Tommy doesn't really yeah, want to I just want to give you one. Yeah. yeah. I need yeah. to get back into this title fight. We don't even know I, what the we, points are. We don't actually know what the points are. We get points every week. Right, someone no please top them up and send us what the points are. Thank you. Yeah, right, okay. I think Matt's probably winning. Um, I've said Logan Sargent will be announced at Williams. He's already doing FP1. Nick DeVries now at Alpha Towery. It makes sense yeah, to do it at the that. USGP. So Big sense, actually. Nice one. I've actually got my two now. Hamilton podium and Verstappen doesn't win. Really? KPM. Um... Right, both has cars out in Q1. And yeah, one Red Bull, one Ferrari, one Merc on the podium. Ooh. Mm -hmm. In any order? Ooh. Yeah, in any order. In any order, yeah. Unless, any order, Tommy, yeah. unless, <laughs> right, I'm going to throw a curveball. Ooh. Tommy, do you take the one prediction of one Red Bull, one Ferrari, one Merc podium, or do you double it up? Double, right? <laughs> so double you, points. If you say in the order that it's correct, you can get double points. Okay. He's taking Ooh. it. I'm taking it and I'm going to go for one Red Bull, one Merc, one Ferrari. I'll change it in the sheet and I'll go for the There we points. go. So, wait, what do you think is going to win? Obviously, Verstappen. Max will win, Hamilton second, and Leclerc third. But I'm not, I'm, it could be it, another yeah, team. It could be any. But Big yeah. sneeze. If you just saw that on video, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> fans, M Wallace 997, Mercedes to top at least one practice session. King Z underscore 40 zero. Perez win. Surge de Groot one. Track limits will be an issue. Sure will. Yeah. Love that. Our track limits. We've not learned about that for ages. The so. Verstopper <laughs> returns. The Verstopper returns. I don't, yeah. Track limits in terms of, I guess, just lap times being deleted. That could be a thing. Um, but there you go, everybody. Oh, I don't know how word. long we've been going for. This I've just seen what the time this. is. Oh my God, it's 10 to 1. I need to go have some lunch. Right, thank you everybody for watching and listening for the w to the WTF1 podcast. Hashtag WTF1 podcast if you want to get involved in the discussion. There's Frank. Uh, he's uh, given us a good wave. Tommy, final thoughts? My final thoughts are shout out to my daughter Grace, who, because she is such a Max fan, if you know the, the story of the onesie and what happened with Leclerc, where she pooped through the onesie on the formation lap, she, she got out of it. Uh, yeah. This time, she saved the poop till after the race. She was in the Max onesie, and then he won the title, and then that was her mic drop moment. Uh, so, yeah, good times. <laughs> the Grace onesie the power, has been retired now. It so has. 100% record. Still. Every time for she Max won, win, For Max wins, yeah. For Max, for Max wins, wins yeah. Remember. But, I mean, that's difficult with That's how he's still, driving is yeah, it yeah. <laughs> great uh, i'm so glad that she won't have to wear onesies next year uh katie final thoughts final thoughts firstly we mentioned it at the start of the episode i'm doing another annual this year it would be amazing if you could support me and purchase a copy pre-order it straight up support well, you. well okay. just, just me and the brand i mean katie, i don't get any, to pay don't get any actual cash to uh... <laughs> code katie 10 to give me money no i don't get any money from it but um it would be cool if we could sell um some annuals and secondly every driver has now scored points this year full-time driver before people jump onto the nico hulkenberg nice. thing but i just think that's a nice little thing to end on because it doesn't happen too often i think the last time it happened was 2018 but i could be wrong that is lovely isn't it nice a lovely and he's got points i know yeah. lovely. What, a what a hero and my final thoughts are I've heard that some of you have been buying this beanie now since I've been wearing it on the podcast because it's beanie season now as we're into October. Uh, so uh, shop.wtf1.com if you want to go get your own or any other bits of merchandise, all right? Lots of love. I love my okay. beanie. So much so you're not wearing it. Cool, yeah, sweet. Um, I'll right. wear it next week. No, that's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs>
Okay, no, we can right, all be the beanie see. crew. Tommy hates beanies or yeah, slash hats, or in, general, hats so. in general. Um, and hates us as well. So thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. Give us a five-star review. If you do, then you may w- well be read out in the next podcast. We love absolutely every single one of you. Thank you for just being a part of this podcast in terms of listening, getting involved. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to share our stupid thoughts with all of you. So um, until that next time. Hours and hours. Until next time, uh, we will see you very soon. Cost cap's actually happening in about three hours from now, so uh, that should be interesting. Uh, So, yeah, we'll see. All right, take care. Adios. Bye-bye. Bye.